Hey, welcome to this featured member interview. We've got Maura here, who's an absolute rock star. She's smashing it, and she's going to be sharing some stuff that she's doing right now, which is pretty amazing given the current climate. So just for those of you who are watching, Maura, before working with me, was pretty successful, but she hit a plateau. She did four deals, made 480K in profit with a 60K a year income. She did that by leveraging the main residence in her house, but she got to a sticking point came and worked with us, got unstuck. She's now got five, six deals in her pipeline. She's raised 180 grand in private funds and she's got more investors lined up to fund her deals. So let's dive into this. So Maura, tell us about the deals that you did beforehand. What was you doing before we met and uh, you know, you, you kind of got into property? So just give us a little bit about your background in a minute or um, so. So I worked full time for the local government. Um, I had a buy to let, that, well, a property that I bought in 2006 um I then started to rent it out and I thought this is a load of crap <laughs> I was earning about 50 quid a month off my buy to let and for years I didn't really do anything but I just thought oh it'd be my pension and then one day I kind of woke up me and Dave were talking and I said um I've always fancied to do property development I had a look at it and all of a sudden I realized I had like a 120k <laughs> um equity in the in my buy to let so that's kind of how we started off doing PM renovations um I then went on we bought a property at auction which was a short lease property um and negotiated with the with the freeholder and etc etc which I can tell you a bit more later um we then decided from a one bedroom flat to go on to a HMO which I really didn't want to do but Dave kept telling me it'd be a great cash flow and we should look at it so we found a derelict property and that time I leveraged against my own home, which I owned outright as well, um, again, because of the funding and stuff. Um, we didn't take any development finance. We just used the money that we'd recycled at the first project. And then I thought to myself, right, if I can do that with one project and leverage my house, why am I not doing it with two? So the next project we did was, which was with a one bedroom flat and another house, um, I bridged against my own sort of home as leverage and did two houses during COVID, well, a house and a flat during the COVID. And we completed them at, the, uh, when was it, about July last year. And they're all rented out. And uh, one was turned into a HMO. Again, we did like lofts, etc. And the other one was a complete refurb, which we made into a minimo. So it was like nice. um, a one bedroom flat, but because of the size, we were able to make it into a two room sort of HMO, share your kitchen, you know, and um, bathroom area. So that's kind of where we got to on our own. But we got to the point we were kind of running out of money. And what do we do now? And do I keep using my house as leverage? And how? Do, what do I do going forward? So I could, kind of that's where I got to before we kind of met. I went on a, um, we, we thought that we'd like to do sort of developments and stuff. So we did go on a mastermind. Um, we did, a, we did a, you know, a three day weekend and thought it was great and rushed to the back of the room to sign up for the mastermind and then kind of realized, you know, we found a site and luckily before we exchanged, I went and got someone to have a look at um, the site, which was a garage we were going to convert into like a house. But the downstairs, the garage would have been like single floor and basement. Um, so when we looked at it and I got someone to, to quote me for the price of the basement, I realized the deal wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that if I'd done it, I might have lost my house. <laughs> wow. So luckily for us at the time, we kind of pulled out of that and um, we carried on doing, you know, then we went on and did the other deals with um, the, the two properties that we did at the end. But it kind of, at that point, and I remember saying to the mentors at that time, you're telling me that the deals, you know, find the deals and the investors will come. But I kept saying, I don't have the confidence I don't have the negotiation skills. And I kept saying, I can't negotiate. Um, I don't know how to talk to people. And if I can't do that, you know, and if I don't believe in myself, who the hell is going to give me money? So yeah. that's kind of where we got to when we met you at um, one of the property meets over in Croydon. And it kind of, that was it kind of thing. So that's where we started to talk. 
Absolutely. So you, you did from what from memory, you didn't actually you didn't stay on on that mastermind for a full term. You decide it wasn't the right thing for you. There's a lot of things that were said that you can go and do. It's it's made made to sound easy, but the reality was there was a whole load of other little distinctions and things that you need that make a big difference. Having the confidence, knowing what to say, knowing how to negotiate, having the right mindset, and so forth. This mastermind, we actually went once a month. Obviously, because of the distance, sometimes we'd stay, whatever have you. We would go once a month and you would send emails. No one replied to you. You tried to make contact. You'd ask questions. And it was like we all sat in a room around together talking to each other. So, yes, you learn off each other. But we weren't able to do progress because, you know, you can give me some of the skills, which is, you know, how build cost works and how to work out the valuations, et cetera, et cetera, or how to find what systems to use, which I use like Nimbus and stuff myself now to, to look for land and deals and properties, whatever have you. But so it gave me some of the tools, but it didn't actually help me for I found a deal. Now, what do I do? Or how do I actually know a deal is a good deal and not a bum deal? <laughs> and the thing is, if you're not getting the support from anyone and you haven't got, you know, you're waiting a whole month, a lot can happen in a month, you know. And for the amount of money that we were paying, I didn't feel I was getting the support and feedback that I should have got at the time. So when I could pull out, which is three months minimum, we pulled out. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a difficult thing. Sometimes if you've got a deal in front of you, you can't wait a month or two months or three, however, you know, whatever it is until you get to your, your mentor. You need the kind of support then and there. So you, we met, you decided to come into the academy, which was, uh, um, I think. It, was, oh, it wasn't straight away, though, if you no, it remember. Wasn't, actually, it, was, it wasn't straight away. It was a little while afterwards. Wasn't I it? was very hard work. <laughs> <laughs> because of what had happened, I suppose, yeah. in the background, I was scared to spending out any more money. So, and I think it did take us a, a while before I thought, yeah, I kind of trust this guy. It might be different. So, <laughs> and, you know, you were actually offering something different that other people, it wasn't about the property. I could find deals. I knew how to bridge stuff. I'd kind of read all that and done all that myself. But what I didn't know was the mindset stuff and stuff that I used to think was mumbo jumbo rubbish. And I'll be honest, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I was one of them people, things happened in the past, put it in a box, put it over there and move on and you know I was very kind of focused if I wanted to driven you know in in work and everything no one could take that away from me personal life and everything could have been a mess but going to work no one could take that away and for me that's how I'd always done everything so if other things had happened that I didn't want to deal with or you know it went in a box and I forgot about it mm. so but you made me unpick all that. <laughs> which, which I did make you unpick all that. We'll dive into that in a little bit because it wasn't an easy process. But you've mentioned something here that's really important. A lot of people go out and do property. They do it first time around. They don't quite get the results. And they sometimes go, oh, I'm not sure about this. I've had my fingers burned. Or maybe it's not for me. It didn't work last time around. But the key thing is they don't know what is actually missing. People sometimes don't know what's missing, which is what's very different about the academy and what we do here. So when you eventually did, you know, trust me and realize that we had something different, and I'm, it's a privilege, by the way, so I'm honored that you trusted me. Um, you came into the academy, you started to work. What were, the, some of the, what were some of the biggest things that you learned? Like what were some of the kind of things that you learned that were the difference that made the difference? You actually had to dig deep inside yourself and you had to understand and unpick what was holding you back, you know, I could have said all along, oh, I can't do that and that's it. But there was something in it, one, you know, that would spur me on. And, you know, I think the more you unpick stuff and looked at things and realised things in your past, trauma or ex-partners or parents or friends, whatever it was, you had to unpick it and try and understand why did certain things happen in life and if I don't want the same pattern to stop me now, what do I need to do differently? And I think from once I kind of understood that and learned quite a lot, I was probably more at peace then with myself and understanding what, what was making me tick, if that makes sense, and what was yeah. stopping me. Because I always did feel I wasn't good enough. You know, I knew I wasn't stupid, but, you know, you might have had people around me telling me, you know, 
well, I was 19 when I fell pregnant with my daughter, you know, oh, you're the stupid one, you, you're the one with a baby. I went off and did a degree because of that, you know. So it was kind of like I would always try to prove everyone wrong. But now I look at it and say, well, why was I doing what I was doing and why did I think I could only go so far? And now I don't have the barriers that I had before. So the barriers is, you know, they're gone. And actually, I can do anything I bloody want. And I don't care. How lovely. <laughs> and that is really, you know, and, and Dave has been a big help because he's one of them people as well. He will always say nothing cannot be got over. You know, everything is get overable. We can do whatever we want. And having someone working with me like that as a partner as well, made me realise, you know what, we can bloody do anything, which I never felt before. So it was having the support sort of for the community, people in the community talking to you and to having a partner that was communicating. It kind of made everything click into place, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, for anyone who's watching the video, one of the things that we have inside the academy is my is my process. It's called the, it's my methodology. It's called the Code of Reaching Excellence. And what I teach in there is the, the four phases of implementation that people go through. The first phase is called the euphoria phase, which is where you go to a mastermind or you decide to do property or some kind of business strategy and you're euphoric, you're buzzed up, you're like, great, I'm going to run to the back of the room. Let me get my credit card and my purse out. Let's pay for it, pay for it. You get to that and, and you get this full sense of achievement because you believe that you can do it. You then go to the next phase, which is called the epiphany phase, where you realize, oh, shoot, this is way harder. I don't know this. I don't know that. I don't know how to do all these other things. Uh, and that's where we experience the resistance. And the resistance is things like the lack of confidence, you know, that negative voice in our head, doubt, um, feeling out of our comfort zone. So if we're lucky, we feel uncomfortable, but sometimes it can even be painful being out of your comfort zone because we are, <clears throat> you know, we're in a situation where in our working careers or the businesses, we're top of our game, we know what we're doing. We're now at the bottom of a learning curve again, and it brings all this stuff up. It brings up all the fear, all the insecurities, all the self-doubt. syndrome was, I think, a big thing for me where I didn't think I was good enough. And I remember going to a dinner dance once with Dave, and he put me, you know, in between two blokes I didn't know. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm a very chatty person if I know people. If I don't know you, I'm sitting there like quite as a church mouse, which I know you won't believe. <laughs> But, you know, and he put me there. And at the end of the night, I ended up talking to these blokes about property and everything else because I came into my own. But it's about being put out of your comfort zone. So Dave will do it to me and so will you do it Absolutely. to me. Where you just go, get on and do it. There you go. You know, and, and you do need that little push where someone will, will push you in the right way to understand why you're doing what you're doing, you know. Absolutely. And this is one of the things that we do. This is one of the things that's different about the academy. It's understanding what is causing the resistance in the first place, what's causing the blocks, what's causing the imposter syndrome, because unless we overcome that stuff, and normally that's deep mindset stuff, it's our belief system, it's the painful experiences that we've had in the past, it's the trauma, it's the upbringing. We'll only ever get as far as our belief system. So just getting out of your comfort zone, okay, that's one thing. You're going to be out, out your comfort zone. But actually, we need to do that inner work. Otherwise, what's going to happen is when we're out of our comfort zone, we're going to need, want to go back to what is or what feels comfortable. So, you, you know, this is part of obviously what we do. But and we did have that phase with me, I think, at one time where I saw, <laughs> I think David spoke to you and I went, someone came and talked to me about being a consultant and going back and doing what I knew what to do, you know, because I used to do performance stuff and uh, reports and stuff for social care. And it was kind of like, do I go back and write programs and fix systems and do what I, what I know, systems analysis stuff, or do I hang it out? And I think at that point I did hit a bit of a rock bottom where yeah. I was like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I, you know, the projects are going along. I haven't got loads of money. You know, what the hell have I done? Because I gave up, you know, I took voluntary redundancy in the February and then we had COVID and it was sort of like, do I just go back to what I know or do I just, carry on so, yeah and that's where i got to at christmas time i think absolutely and it, and it happens for a lot of people because we you know unless unless we learn how to deal with the uncertainty and also deal with being out of our comfort zone which apart from what we do inside the academy most people don't know how to handle that most mentors don't know how to teach that but it's essential if you want to move forwards because people will experience a crisis of confidence. And if you don't know, number one, it's normal, this happens, and you haven't got the tools and the right support to navigate it, most people would have gone back to their job or their business or whatever. And you can apply this to any context of your life. 
is getting out of your comfort zone. So, you, you know, you had the support there. And you mentioned earlier on the, the, the first um, mastermind you want, went on, there wasn't the support. What's the difference in the support that you have inside the academy? Like, how did that make a difference for you? I think it's because we had a lot smaller group. We talked, well, yes, we talked about property, et cetera, but a lot of the stuff was about mindset, what we're doing. We have kind of more of a community and like a friendship group because property can kind of be lonely. Yeah. If you're just meeting someone once a month, you don't get to know them. But we talk like every week, probably twice a week, and pro- you know, with some of the, the guys, I talk to them every day, you know, and I think what happened sort of at Christmas time, I remember talking to Nisha and Jazz and I just sort of said, do you know what? Actors' job is actually not to hold our hands and take us through all of this. We've got to do it, you know. And I think that was my light bulb moment where I goes, "Why? What am I waiting for?" You know, we've done the emotional stuff. We've done the stuff where, you know, I've now got this belief I can actually do it. It's not actors' do- job to hold me, you know, by the hand and say, "Maura, this is the deal. This is the." the, the. And I just went, "Do you know what? No one's going to do it for me. Get on and do it." And all of a sudden, it just went bang like that, where all of these deals started to come in because something obviously changed in me and my mindset with it. Absolutely. And that, that was a real pivotal moment for you. And Yeah, I will hold people's hands when they need it, especially when you go through that that discomfort yeah. and that, you know, because that's a very um, uncomfortable and sometimes a painful and lonely place to go. And when people go through that, which if you come into the academy and you do your work, you are going to go through some emotional discomfort when you get out of your comfort zone. But you, you, people need to know that that's okay. So there's a level of handholding, but you got to a point where you took ownership and responsibility and thought... Yeah, because, you know, I'm going, well, I haven't got any other deals since I joined this course. And I could have just said, well, this course is just like every other course and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but then I just went, hang on a minute. It's not his job to go and find me a deal and <laughs> do the work for me. That's my job. And I think once I kind of realised, actually, this whole thing was not what I thought it was, if that makes sense. Because in the beginning, you think, oh, it's all property, it's this, that. But once you realise, actually, it's all about changing your mindset and what you do and how you go forward, that's when everything kind of falls into place and changes for you. Absolutely. So what? why, and, you know, people are watching this, why do we change our mindset? Well, your, your mindset is the operating system of your mind. It's like, you know, you can't download an app from 2021 and put it onto Windows 95. This is why we have to do some of that deeper inner work we need to do and change our mindset because we've all got old, outdated thoughts, patterns, beliefs that just, they would have served us at one point in the past. They just don't serve us for us to get to that next stage in our life. If we want to level up our business, we want to level up our life. We have to change our belief system because we'll only ever get as far as our beliefs will allow us to take us. So if you want to change- And, your and results, the people like, around you as well. So I think you. that was a huge difference. And people say, you know, your network is, you know, the five people you're around, et cetera. And it is so true because, you know, I've got friends and I love my friends, you know, that I've, I've had for years and everything, but no one actually knew what I was doing or no one understood what I was doing or got it. You know, I don't know anyone that's done what me and Dave are doing. I don't know anyone. So I have no one to go and ask locally that I know. So having the community, we can bounce the ideas and we don't feel silly or are we doing, you know, is it pie in the sky what we're thinking and it doesn't happen to people like, you know, me. <laughs> but, you know, we were able to talk to each other and, you know, talk to the other members and you kind of then realise, well, actually, we can all do it and we kind of support each other, which my friends wouldn't be able to do because they don't have the interest in property or they don't, you know, people, everybody's different. And I know that from managing people for over the years that you have people that want to do nine to five and, go in and come out you know but yeah 